You can go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20. Lord willing, we're going to finish up our series on the Ten Commandments this morning. For those of you who were here last week, you know that means we're going to cover three commandments. So we're not going to mess around too much with an introduction. We're going to get moving right along. Exodus chapter 20. Uh, last week we looked at commandments number 6 and number 7. Thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not commit adultery. Today we're going to be looking at the last three. Number seven, or excuse me, number 8, number 9, and number 10. Uh, for the sake of flow, we're actually going to be looking at number 9 and then going back to number 8 and then number 10. So I know what I'm doing. I'm not uh, completely crazy. I'm not out of my mind. I'm doing the best that I can just to do this uh, in the best flow possible. All right, we're going to begin reading in verse number 15. Verse 15, number 15 of Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt not steal. Verse number 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Verse number 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And that's the Ten Commandments. Like I said, we're going to be looking at number 9, and then we're going to go back to number 8, and then we're going to go back to number 10, just for the sake of flow. Commandment number 9, do not uh, bear false witness against thy neighbor. You remember last week I said when we were looking at commandment number 6 and number 7, it was very simple. In the Hebrew, God actually used two words for both of those commandments. No murder, no adultery. It continues on when we're looking at number 8 and number 9. No lying, no stealing. Very simple. There are no exception clauses. There are no reasons why it might be okay in certain situations. There are no people that this does not apply to. God says no lying, no stealing. First, we're going to be looking at lying. And obviously, uh, this is something that's very big in our culture. Kids do not have to be taught how to lie. That's something that they know from the room. That's something as soon as they come out, uh, they know exactly how to lie. Now, they might not be very good at it, uh, if you've ever uh, worked with a two- or three-year-old or four-year-old that's learning how to lie for the first time, it's really not that hard to see through. But eventually they get better at it and they'll actually practice. Uh, some of you have probably had a kid that uh, went through that stage. I had two sisters and both of them went through this where for like three, three or four weeks at a time they would just lie incessantly all the time about completely inconsequential things that did not matter. Like they weren't in trouble or anything, but they would just lie. And it was just practicing to see if they could fool mom or dad or whoever it else it was that they were talking to. They were learning how to be a better liar. And uh, sometimes we grow out of that, and sometimes we don't. There are a lot of us, even in churches, that continue to be serial liars, uh, where it's just one lie right after the other, and we tell another lie to be able to cover up another. And like I said, God did not give us any exception clauses. There is no fine print to these Ten Commandments. Uh, a lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. Whether it's a big lie or a small lie, it is true or it is false. Titus chapter 1, verse number 2 tells us that we serve a God who literally cannot lie. And over and over in the Bible, we hear that Satan is a liar, that he's a liar from the beginning, and that he is the father of lies. And whatever comes out of our mouth says an awful lot about whose team we are on. Uh, there's a lot of things that we say, there's a lot of things that come out of our mouth, out of our lips, and, and whether we say what is true, or whether we say what is false, says a lot about what kind of a Christian, or even just what kind of a person we are. How many of you have ever been lied to or lied about? I'm pretty sure every single one of us could raise our hand. Does it feel very good? No, it really doesn't. Having somebody lie to you, that, that really doesn't feel very good, but having somebody lie about you, now that really hurts, especially when it's done in a derogatory or a hurtful way. Uh, this is something that all of us have to deal with, some of us more than others, uh, but some of the most damaging, hurtful things that have ever been said about me were not about things that were true. There's plenty of them. But there's also a lot of times when people have said things about me or they've said things about you that are just plain false. And it hurts. This is what, uh, what I almost said Paul, this is what God and Moses were talking about when they said, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, the, the pure uh, way that you want to look at this is actually talking more about perjury uh, in, in a court of law when you are called to testify. When somebody asks you, is this how it happened or what actually went on? And you say something against your neighbor about somebody else that is clearly not true. God says that's a sin. That is one of the Ten Commandments, God's top ten. He said, out of all the sins that what you could talk about, I'm going to talk about these ten. These are the highest. These are the utmost. These are the most important. These are the first and the last. And the, ten, and the thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor made it into the top ten. That tells me God takes it very, very seriously. Being lied about is not Fun. Now, there are several reasons why we lie. People justify it one way or the other. 
Uh, we lie to get out of things. If there's something that you don't want to do, if there's something you want to get out of, well, then you're going to tell a lie. Maybe it's a half-truth. Maybe it's something where technically it's true, but you're going to deceive somebody. You're going to say it in a different way so that you can get out of something. Uh, sometimes we lie to avoid an awkward situation. Uh, we lie to make ourselves look better. Uh, where if somebody actually knew what I'm really like or the reason why I did something, they would think I'm a terrible person. Well, maybe you are a terrible person, and that person ought to know that. Uh, sometimes we lie, and I think this is a lot of it, we lie to get what we want. When we can't get what we want, when we want something, and we can't get it legally, and we can't get it honestly, we lie in order to get it. It's all about us. It's all about what we want. It's all about what we need. God says no matter what your reasoning is, no matter how you justify a lie, a lie is a lie is a lie. And there's no reason that anybody should ever say anything that is false. I got a couple different ways for you that we lie. Uh, we lie when we say or when we imply something is true when it is not. And conversely, we lie when we, imply some, when we say or imply something is not true when it is. This is the most basic, easy way that you can say that is a lie. When you say something that is completely opposite of the truth. Uh, we also lie when we give half the truth, when we hold back pertinent facts. Uh, when you're angry at somebody and you want to give half the truth, when you want to say something that is technically true, but it's meant to deceive, that's also a lie. Uh, a lot of times people will tell a story about something that happened, and technically the part that they tell did happen, it is true, but they hold back something that would definitely add something to the conversation. Uh, you know, when, when your little kid comes to you and, you know, uh, Susie screams uh, because Billy pulled her hair, mom, he pulled my hair, and you go and you check it out, you talk to Billy about it, and you find out that Billy's got three missing teeth, he didn't, or she didn't tell the whole story. There are pertinent facts that are involved in this. And sometimes if you're going to tell on somebody else, or if you're going to bear witness, you've got to tell the whole story. You've got to give everything uh, that is pertinent to that situation. Uh, we also lie when we present a rumor or an opinion as fact. And this is a big one. This is something that a lot of people get in trouble with, uh, is when we present a rumor or an opinion as fact, something that we heard from somebody else and we pass it along, whether it's true or not. We don't bother to check our facts. And this is big on the Internet. If you're on Facebook, you've seen this over and over again where people pass something along and they say something in a conversation or they share something on Facebook that is just clearly not true. Christians are a, a big offender in this area. Uh, one of the things you've probably seen me get upset and offended at somebody and they actually get offended back at me uh, is when somebody posts something on Facebook that is just absolutely clearly not true. One of the big things that happens over and over and over again is anything that has to do with the Mark of the Beast TM. It's crazy. Ever since like 2009, when they started talking about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, they started posting these articles and they started writing these, uh, these pieces about how somewhere buried deep within this trillion page document that nobody read, there was a, a stipulation that everybody starting in 2010 was going to be uh, forced to take a microchip in their right hand. They were writing this kind of stuff. They were writing these articles and saying, this is true. Well, obviously 2010 came and went. It didn't happen. It wasn't in the bill. They made it up. They pulled it out of completely thin air. They said something that was completely not true. 2010 came and went. Nothing happened. 2011 came and went. What did they do? They kept on changing the date. They said starting in 2012, starting in 2013, 2014. The other day I saw one somebody posted one that said starting in 2016. They keep on sharing this stuff. They keep on passing this stuff along. And a lot of people, and I'm not angry at any one specific person. I'm not angry at anybody in my church. A lot of people do this out, out of uh, just, just concern. Uh, I'm not calling them stupid. I'm not saying they don't know what they're talking about. A lot of people have done this. I could give you a list of about 15 or 20 people, and most of them aren't even in our church that have done this. And I know that there are people in our church that have done this, and I'm not calling them stupid, and I'm not saying that they don't know what they're talking about. But it's very important for us to make sure that when we tell somebody something else, that we make sure that what, it, they're say, that what we're saying is fact, that it's true. Because when you pass along somebody else's lie, you become an accomplice to that lie. It's really not that hard to find out whether something is true or not. And if you're not sure, don't pass it along. Some of this stuff is so simple and so basic. And you say, well, is it really hurting anything? Is it really hurting anybody? No, not exactly, but when you look at it another way, you could say that it really is hurting all of us as God's people, and it's hurting all of us as Christians, as a church. Because what happens when you've got a friend or a family member or somebody on Facebook that sees these kind of articles or sees something that you pass along that is clearly not true, 
And they say, that is ridiculous. It's completely false. What is that going to reflect on us as Christians? It's going to make us all look like a bunch of pants sweaters that get nervous and get upset and soil our shorts over things that are never going to happen. That doesn't reflect good on any of us. Be very careful when we present something as fact when it simply isn't, or if you don't know. If you don't know whether something is true or not, especially if it's harmful towards somebody else, make sure that you check your facts. Another way that we do this is we lie when we make a promise that we have no intention of keeping. This is another thing, this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, uh, you've heard it by, said by them of old time, not the child forswear thyself, but I say unto you, uh, swear not at all, neither by heaven for its God's throne, nor by, his footstool, nor, or by uh, the earth for its, his footstool, nor by Jerusalem for it's the city of the great king. He says, uh, let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. Your word needs to count for something. If you make a promise, you need to keep it, and you should not make a promise if you do not intend to keep it. You need to do everything that you possibly can. Even if circumstances are outside of your control, you need to make as big of an effort as you possibly can to keep promises that you have made. Uh, Stealing, commandment number eight. Being stolen from really hurts as well. How many of you have ever been stolen from? Most of us can say, even if it was something small. The biggest thing that I've ever had really stolen from me that I know of uh, it was my freshman year when I was at college. You would think that there are actually some pretty decent, honest people at Bible college, but that's not always the case. Uh, when I was there my freshman year, I went and I bought a bunch of my books. I bought some of them online, but some of them had to be bought at the, the school bookstore. And uh, those of you that have been through college or sent a kid through, you know it's very expensive for the books alone. And so I spent about 450 bucks on, on books just for my classes that semester. And I bought them, and I set them down in the student commons, and I went to go check my mail, same building, not, not the same room, but I set them down where it was a populated area. If somebody took them, which I never would have assumed would have happened, somebody would have seen it, right? Well, I came back after checking my mail. I was gone for less than two minutes, and they were gone. Poof, vanished into thin air. Somebody took my books. I don't know what they did with them. I checked around with the lost and found. I checked around with security. I checked around with the bookstore to see if anybody had found anything. Never took, uh, found a trace of these books. Somebody had stolen my books, and I had to go spend another 450 bucks to replace them. That hurt. If you ask me at that point, was stealing wrong? Yes, it was wrong because somebody had stolen from me. And yet, we justify stealing oftentimes when it is impersonal, when it's not a person that we're stealing from, or when it's at least from a person that we don't know, that we're never going to have to see or we're never going to have to deal with. Uh, one of the ways that we do this is uh, when we justify stealing because it's impersonal is when we steal from a business. Uh, people shoplift all the time. I don't think anybody in here shoplifts. I hope not, but there are Christians that do. Uh, I had a friend actually in Bible college. I, I tell you all terrible, terrible things about the things and the people that were at Bible college, and you must think that I went to some crazy school. But anyway, this, this guy that I went to school with uh, told me after he confessed and after he was done with it, he never actually got caught. He never actually had to replace anything, which is probably wrong. But he actually confessed to me that over a period of about six months or a semester, he had stolen hundreds of dollars worth of stuff, worth of merchandise from Walmart. He said Walmart's one of the easiest places in the world to steal stuff, to shoplift. You'll never get caught. He's stolen hundreds of dollars. And the way that he justified it was by saying, well, Walmart's, you know, is a, is a multi-billion dollar uh, American industry giant. And, you know, me stealing a pack of beef jerky every once in a while, that's not going to hurt anybody. That's not going to hurt their bottom line. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're stealing something small from somebody big or whether you're stealing something small, uh, whether you're stealing something big from somebody small. Stealing is stealing. Whether you are stealing from a person or whether you're stealing from a business, you are still stealing. You're taking something that is not yours. Another way that we would do this is through stealing from our employer. And this is something that we justify all the time. You say, well, I'm not paid enough, so I'm going to steal office supplies or I'm going to steal uh, merchandise. Uh, I've actually heard the statistics say that the average employee will steal five times more from their employer than the average shoplifter will. Five times more an employee will steal than a shoplifter will. That's unbelievable. And yet we see this all the time. Those of you that have worked in, in, in a job, uh, you, you know when people are stealing. You know when people are taking stuff from their employer, when stock goes missing, or when stuff is, is just gone. It vanishes into thin air. This kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, you, when you look at certain restaurants, you look at, uh, if you've ever been to uh, a restaurant, you know that some restaurants, you, the, the server will handle all the money, and then some other, certain other restaurants, you will have a, uh, a cashier. You ever wonder why? It's because the, the restaurants that have a cashier don't trust their servers. The restaurant that I worked at in Texas, 
we handled all the money, and if I wanted to, I could have stolen 20 or $30 every night that I worked from my employer, and they would never have known. They would never have even suspected. Other restaurants, like Cracker Barrel, which I worked at for like five years, they've got a cashier. Why? Because they don't trust their servers. This is a, a big deal. We had, uh, at, at our security in Cracker Barrel, this, they, they have, they're almost paranoid about uh, their employees stealing from them. Uh, at Cracker Barrel, you know, they've got the big store, and that's, that's an area where so much stuff could get stolen, and I'm sure it does. They had one camera for the whole store. They had two for over the cashiers because they didn't trust their cashiers. And they had six cameras in the back of the house to watch over the employees. One camera for the customers, and what, what did I say? Eight cameras for the employees. Because people steal from their employers. They justify it by saying, well, I make barely more than minimum wage, or I work hard and my employer doesn't uh, pay me fairly for it. Doesn't matter. If you steal from your employer, you are stealing. People steal cash. They steal supplies. We ha I had a friend that actually got caught. I don't know if I would really call him a friend. But anyway, this guy would take, would take like whole packages of meat, and, and he would wrap them up in plastic wrap, and he would dump them in the mop bucket uh, so that there wouldn't be any water or anything, any chemicals on it. He would wrap it really good. He'd dump it in the mop bucket, and he'd take it outside dump it. He'd take the meat that he, pa that he got, like $30 worth of this meat, and he would put it into his car. Never got caught. He, he, he uh, used it. He did this kind of thing for like months at a time before he finally got caught and got fired. This kind of stuff is ridiculous. People steal from their employers all the time, five times more than the average shoplifter will. Uh, another way we do this is through identity theft. I'm sure there, there's people here that have had their identities stolen. They see stuff on their credit card that they certainly didn't imagine there would be there. That's, that's definitely stealing. You may never meet the person that you steal, that, whose identity you steal, uh, but it's still, still theft. Uh, another big way is through tax fraud. I'm not saying that you can't take advantage of the deductions and, and all of the things that you can take advantage of legally uh, to lower your tax liability, but when you lie to the IRS and when you say that you made less money than you did or if you work under the table or you uh, manipulate your tax returns in order to make your uh, return as big as you possibly can illegally, you are literally stealing. You say, well, sometimes it feels like the IRS is stealing from me, so I'm just taking a little bit back. No, you're actually stealing from all of us. You're stealing from the person next to you. When you steal from the IRS, you are stealing from all of us. You are stealing from the rest of the taxpayers. Because eventually, if, people, if the IRS doesn't collect enough taxes, guess what's going to happen? Rates are going to go up, and the honest people are the ones that are going to have to pay for it. Uh, another way that we do this, and you might disagree with this, another way that we steal is when we take advantage unfairly of something that is free. When we take unfair advantage of, of somebody else's generosity. Uh, and like I said, you might disagree with this, but, but for me... If you load your 13 kids up into the minivan and you say, guess what, kids? We're going to go out to dinner tonight. Where are we going, Dad? We're going to go to Sam's Club. We're all going to take six or seven trips around all the free samples and leave without buying anything. I believe that that constitutes stealing. I, I, I personally, you know, free dinner. We don't buy anything. We're just going to get out of there and we're going we're to have a free dinner. And there are people that do this. They go to Sam's Club and, and Costco and any of these other places that have a lot of free samples and they do, do this just for free. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Another thing that I saw last summer when we were doing the movie nights, it kind of was amusing. Uh, you know, we, we did free hot dogs, free cotton candy, soda, and everything else like this. And it was great. It was a lot of fun. We, we had like 75 people out come out uh, for a movie night one night. And it was a really great time. But I kid you not, one night I actually saw this woman. She was wearing a hoodie. doesn't go to our church, so don't try to figure out who it was. Uh, there was a, a woman wearing a hoodie, and she literally took three cans of soda from the cooler after the movie was over. After we were cleaning up and everything like that, she took three cans of soda from the cooler, shoved them into her pocket in the front of her hoodie, one more in each hand, and she had her kids take a couple more. And they walked home with like a 12-pack. Now, my wife and I, we bought the soda, so I wasn't going to say anything about it. It's like three bucks with the bottle deposit. But I believe that that constitutes stealing. Why? Because that's not what it was for. We did not bring, invite these people in, into our home and into our church in order to take away more than what we intended to give them. I wasn't going to say anything, and I didn't, but guess what? The very next week, as soon as the movie was about halfway over, I took the sodas and brought them inside so that wouldn't happen again. You can steal by taking unfair advantage of somebody else's generosity or by abusing a system. Another way that we steal is when you hold something back from somebody else. When you take something, when you hold something back that doesn't belong to you. Uh, when an employer actually will steal from an employee's wages. This happened to me when I was like 17, 18 years old. I worked somewhere uh, at another restaurant. I worked in a lot of restaurants, I guess. And uh, I was working there for about three weeks, and my, uh, my boss actually decided that an IOU was about the same as a check. No, it's not. 
So I didn't last at that job for very long. I decided I'm, I'm not going to stick around for very long. Never got uh, a check from them, even though I'd worked for like three weeks. Uh, we do this, and, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this as well. But I'm going to uh, get down a little bit deeper, and I'm going to say, even though you might not consider yourself to be an employer, uh, you very well might be. If you ever go out to eat, and you have go to like a full-service restaurant, and you've got a server, you are that server's employer. Whether you're a Cracker Barrel or whether you are Brad Clark, you are that server's employer for that half hour, 45 minutes, hour and 15, whatever, however long you're there. You are that server's employer. And when you do not pay them fairly, you are literally stealing from them. The Bible says a lot about this kind of thing. In James chapter 5, it says, Woe to you, rich men, weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon you, the cries of the laborers whose, whose wages you have held back by fraud have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. God is saying, listen, when you don't pay your employees fairly, when you, do not, when you hold back their wages by fraud, God knows and God hears, and he's going to hold you accountable for that. If you do not tip your waiter or waitress fairly, you are taking advantage of them, and you are not paying them fairly, and you are literally stealing from them. Now, I kind of take this personally because most of the income that I've made in my lifetime has actually been through tips. So maybe I take this a little bit too personally. But a lot of people don't even understand the concept of tipping. They don't understand why we do it. They don't understand what is expected of them. A lot of people think that when you put a $5 bill down on that table, that that server gets to keep all $5. No, they don't. Nowhere do they get to keep all $5. A couple places they might get to keep more than others. But what a lot of people don't understand is that servers and other tipped employees are not taxed based on what they make. They're taxed for income tax purposes based on what they sell. The government assumes that 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 server is going to make 20% tip based on what you ate. If you and your family go out to dinner and you rack up a $100 bill, $100 check, the government assumes that you as their server is going to make $20 off that table. They assume you're going to make 20%, and they tax you based on that. If you leave them nothing, they're still going to get taxed based on $20. Once again, because uh, if they don't do that, uh, most of the time servers are going to be tax frauds. They're not going to report all their income, so the government has to do it for them. And so they're taxed based on 20%. For FICA, federal, and state income taxes, you're looking at somewhere between 15 and 20% tax rate. So if you and your family go out to dinner, you rack up a $100 restaurant check, that employee will lose, your employee will pay around $3 worth of income tax just for the privilege of waiting on you, whether you give them anything or not. Three dollars goes right out. Uh, A lot of other restaurants, most other restaurants for that matter, actually a a server is also required to tip out a hostess, a busser, a bartender, other employees that are also paid based on tips. Whether you tip them anything or not, it's based on their sales. The industry standard is four percent. Okay, so if you rack up a hundred dollar restaurant check, not only is three dollars gone to the federal and state governments, but another $4, if, you're, if they're going to follow the industry standard, goes to other employees. So if you tip them literally nothing, if you do not tip your, empl- your employee for that moment, they will lose $7 just for the privilege of waiting on you. 15% all of a sudden doesn't sound that generous. A lot of people think, well, if I, if I tip 5%, well, that's just extra money for them. No, it's not. The federal minimum wage for servers is $2.13 an hour. How many of you can live on that? Your responsibility, if you go out to eat in a full-service restaurant, I'm not talking about buffets, I'm not talking about Starbucks, I'm not talking about any of that. In a full-service restaurant, your responsibility is to pay your server fairly. And what you need to understand is that if you pay them 15%, literally half of it, they will never see. So if you give that server $10, a 10% tip, they walk away with $3 for the hour, hour and a half that you were there. That, doesn't, that would tick me off. And I saw it all the time as a server. Now, servers can make really good money. You say, well, what if I got terrible service? That happens. Talk to a manager. If you get terrible service at Dunkin' Donuts, you're not going to pay less for your donut and coffee. You're going to talk to a manager. That's what you're supposed to do. You, you, and a lot of times people don't understand that a server actually has a lot more going on than what you see. They have a lot of responsibilities that you will never be aware of. We need to make sure that we, as Christians especially, are tipping our employees well. If you are going to bow your head over your food, if you're going to ask the Lord to bless your meal and other people see it, especially your server, and you're going to tip them unfairly, that does not reflect well on Christ. If you're going to leave a a track with a lousy tip, I would have nothing good to say about you as a Christian. That is a terrible, 
terrible testimony, and yet Christians do it all the time. Uh, another way that we do this, and I'm going to keep on ticking people off, another way that we steal is when we steal from God. Uh, Malachi chapter 3. I know I talked about money a little bit ago, and I hate to do this more than I absolutely have to, but this is just for the sake of what we're talking about. Uh, the Ten Commandments, we steal from God, perhaps more than we steal from anybody else. Malachi chapter 3 is a classic passage on this. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. Will a man rob God, they ask? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? God is saying, listen, my, my people, my children have robbed me. They have taken something that was not theirs. And the people ask, well, where have we robbed thee? Just like a little kid will. Well, what do you mean? We haven't robbed you. Where have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of, of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. God is saying, listen, if I have given you everything. Everything that you have belongs to me, 100% of it. I'm asking for just 10%, the tithe, back. If you look in the Old Testament, actually, when you consider all the tithes and all the offerings and everything else that God demanded of his people, it was actually closer to 25 to 27%, depending on the year. 10% is the minimum. That's where it begins. None, none of the other offerings are we obligated to fulfill in the New Testament. We're not obligated to do any of the offerings or any of the other things that they talk about in the Old Testament. But the tithe, giving generously, giving regularly, giving cheerfully, that is definitely repeated in the New Testament. And when God says, you have robbed me because you have kept back by fraud what you owe me, the things that I'm, the very bare minimum, 10%, when you're keeping that back, you have literally robbed me. And you are under a curse. If you want to interpret this any other different way, you're more than welcome to talk to me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but I don't see any other way that you can interpret this. God says you are under a curse. Literally, you are cursed, not by the devil. You are cursed by God when you do not return the tithe. God owns everything, and your responsibility as a Christian, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, if you're not going to heaven someday, this does not apply to you. Okay? Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. If you're, going, if you're not going to heaven, then there's no point. Okay? So if you're not a Christian, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about God's people. I'm talking about God's children. God says, if you do not return the tithe, the 10% that I'm asking of my people, you are literally under a curse. And then he continues and he says, listen, if you're not already a tither, if you're not already giving to the Lord by conviction, he says, test me, prove me, try it out, and I will open the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing so great upon you that you will not even be able to contain it. Now, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about name it and blame it, blab it and grab it. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not one of these guys that says, if you give God a dollar, he'll give you a hundred. Not saying that at all. Because being financially blessed is not the only way that we can be blessed. Absolutely not. God continues on. He says, and if you do this, if you prove me, if you give the tithe, which I have commanded you to do, if you stop robbing me, he says, I will pour down a blessing on you and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. A lot of you are being continually attacked by the devil and God is doing nothing about it because you have not done what he asked you to do. You want to interpret that any different way? Let's talk. But I'm going to stick with what the Bible has to say. God says, prove me now. If you're not a tither by conviction, you say, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. You are telling God, every time you say, I can't afford to tithe, I can't afford 10%, I can do six, uh, I'll meet you halfway, how about five? What you are telling God, every time you say that you cannot afford to tithe, you are telling him that he cannot and will not pour down his blessings upon you. You are telling God that you do not trust him to meet your needs. There's no other way around it. There's no other way to interpret that. God promises his people in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse number 8 through 10, read it yourself. Spend a lot of time reading it. God says, test me, prove me, and I will pour out a blessing on you so great that you will not even be able to contain it. There are people that are in this room that could testify of this, that could stand up and say, ever since I became a tither by conviction, I have seen the blessing of God in my life. Now, it might not be financial. God might not park a Ferrari in your driveway tomorrow morning. You might not become a millionaire overnight just because you gave the tithe on Sunday. Financial blessing is not the only way that we can be blessed, but when you are blessed by God, when you become in tune with God about what it means to be blessed, you will never want for anything more. 
Not that you will be rich, not that you'll have more than what you need, but God promises to meet your needs and to pour down a blessing so great that you won't even be able to contain it. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I believe that you can do more with 90% when 10% is given to God than you could ever do with 100% that you kept for yourself. I honestly believe that. If you're not a Christian, not talking to you. This is not for you. But if you are a child of God, God says, I will curse you, literally, if you do not do what, you, what I've asked you to do. Last commandment, we'll do, cover this one really quick, no coveting. Like I said, even if you follow God, even if you obey, even if you give the tithe and the offering and so forth, you're not always going to be financially blessed. And a lot of Christians are guilty of this one, where we covet, where we want something else. Uh, there, was, there was a period of time in America when somebody would see uh, somebody that had something, they had a nice car, they had a nice house, and they would say, you know what, someday maybe I'm going to be able to have that myself. Maybe if I work really hard and I'm going to be able to, to put money away, I'm going to be able to afford that nice car, I'm going to be able to afford that nice house. Well, today it's completely different for a lot of people where they don't see somebody that has a nice car and they think maybe someday if I work really hard I can get that. No, they actually get angry at the person that has it. And they say, why should they have it and not me? That's what coveting is really all about. It's not about saying, you know, I I'm completely happy with everything that I have and never wanting to improve yourself, never wanting nice things. That's not what this commandment is all about. This commandment is about coveting your neighbor's stuff about taking pleasure in something that they have and wishing that they did not have it and wanting it for yourself. He gives a list of all the different things that you can covet. He says, don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's manservant or his maidservant. Don't covet his ox. You say your neighbor doesn't have an ox. Okay, most of us don't. But it, maybe they have a car. Don't covet your neighbor's ass. Don't covet your neighbor's anything. He says he covers all the ground. Anything that is thy neighbor's. God wants you to be satisfied. God wants you to be happy with what he wants for you to have. You see, a lot of times we don't think of ourselves as children, but unfortunately God actually does. How many of you, if your kid asked for everything in the world, would you give it to him? There's a lot of things that, kid ask, that kids ask for that are not good for them. It's the same way with us. There's a lot of things that we ask for as God's children that are not good for us, and God does not want us to have them. One's life does not consist of one's possessions, Jesus says. And we live in, in a culture that is so consumed with consumerism, where we've got to have the newest, and we've got to have the best, and we've got to have uh, the brightest and the shiniest, and we've got to have what somebody else has. We've got to keep up with the Kardashians. No, no, no. You can't live that way if you're a Christian. Because coveting robs us of the joy and the gratitude of having what God intends for us to have. Now, it's not about complacency. That's something that I, I have to you know, constantly be pulling at. Uh, you know, the, the, the tug of war between complacency and contentment. And this goes to a lot, a lot more than materialism. But where does it become wrong when you are complacent or when you are uh, discontented? You know, you're constantly pulling, you're constantly fighting that battle because I believe that both of them are wrong. I don't believe that we should be complacent. You should be content. That's the difference. That's where you're supposed to be. Contentment is about being satisfied with what God wants you to have. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. You don't have to turn there, but you can read it later. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to suffer need and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul is saying here in Philippians chapter 4, as he's closing out his book, he says, listen, I know how to be poor, and I know how to be rich. I know how to have everything that I ever wanted, and I know how to have nothing but the shirt on my back. But I have learned how to be happy, how to be joyful, how to be thankful for everything that I have, because I can do all things and be all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whether you are rich or whether you are poor, when you are blessed by God, you will never want for anything else. Contentment is wanting for ourselves what God wants for us and being happy with that result. A lot of people want more. They want something different. They want something better. They want something newer. They want something shinier. God says, I want you to be satisfied. I want you to be contented. And as long as we are discontented, as long as we are coveting our neighbor's property, as long as we are angry at somebody else for having something that we don't have, God says, I'm never going to bless you. I'm never going to satisfy your need because you are unwilling to be satisfied. Why would God bother? Contentment with godliness is great gain. 
We need to be satisfied as God's people because He has given literally everything for us. God wants to bless His people. We are His children, the sheep of His pasture, and God wants to bless us. He wants to lead us beside still waters. He wants to guide us through life. doesn't mean we're going to have everything that we want. doesn't mean we're going to have a Ferrari parked in your driveway tomorrow morning. But God wants to bless you, and He wants you to be satisfied with what He's given you. But you've got to decide in your own heart that whatever it is, whatever He gives me, whether He gives me a car, whether He gives me a house, whether He gives me this, whether He gives me that, I am going to be satisfied. It's not about wanting things. It's about being satisfied whether you get those things or not. Is that basically clear enough for you? There, there's a big division there. It's not wrong to want things. But it is wrong when we're dissatisfied or we're upset when we don't get those things. You can pray for things. I've prayed for things and God's given them to me. It's not wrong to want things, but it's wrong to be dissatisfied or angry at God when you don't get those things. Because God has already given everything that we need. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what the Christian life is supposed to be all about. It's about understanding that I am not God, but He is, and He knows what's best for me, as a father does for his children. And I'm thankful for that. We might go through trials in life, we might have struggles, we might have things that we wish we uh, weren't having to go through, but God promises to overcome. God promises to get us through the hard times. God promises to meet all of our needs. Might not be by much, but God promises to meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your generosity to us. And Lord, there's, there's nobody that's in this room that has a need that isn't being met. There may be a want, there may be a desire, but Father, you have promised and you have fulfilled every promise that you have made to us. Father, we have not always held up our end of the bargain. We've talked about all these Ten Commandments, and I'm pretty sure that if we dug down deep enough, every single one of us, myself included, could find uh, an area in our life in which we have broken each and every one of the Ten Commandments. But we pray for your grace. We pray for your mercy. We pray that as we go through life, that we would let our light so shine before men that they would see that we are more than just a people that fulfill these arbitrary rules and regulations, but that we love you enough to obey where it matters most. I pray for your blessing for this church, for all of us as individuals. I pray that you'll work in all of our lives in such a way that we know that you're there, that, you, that we know that you are a great God, a mighty God, and that we can do all things because you strengthen us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.